What's going on, everybody? It's Max the Catfish, and we are back with what I think is probably going to be the third in our tutorial series here in 2022 of Stellaris. I am giving a big refresher on a beginner's tutorial for the game because there's a lot to learn. And the last two tutorials, we talked about your first steps out in space, technology and leaders, edicts and what traditions are and how you gain them, and also how to explore space and what out is all out there. If you haven't seen those and you want to catch up, you should go back a couple of steps. I'll probably put a uh, link to the very first tutorial up in the, uh, the screen here as you're looking at it. But if you're joining us after our last tutorial, welcome back. We're taking a look at Alpha Centauri 3, which is a planet closest to Earth that we've found so far, but we can't colonize it because it has this anomaly on it that's giving us a little bit of pause. We're not quite sure if we should colonize this planet. We're not even sure what's wrong with it. It just seems strange. And so I'm gonna have to take one of our science vessels and go explore Alpha Centauri 3. Now, I grabbed our science vessel by clicking on it from the galaxy map, and then I zoomed into the star map. I still have them grabbed. I still have them in my uh, uh, kind of my selector. You can see in the bottom left-hand corner. And Alpha Centauri 3 has this icon underneath it which is the icon for an anomaly. We've been skipping most of these anomalies because they take a lot of time to research, but this one is particularly important for us specifically because it exists on a planet that I wanna colonize. And you have to clear that anomaly before you can colonize it. So with our science vessel um, selected, I'm gonna right click on Alpha Centauri and I'm gonna choose research. And our science vessel makes a path. It completely forgets about what it was going to do. It wipes its cue and it heads down to Alpha Centauri to research that anomaly. And that's going to take some time. It might even have some, some decisions that we're going to need to make in the process of that. Uh, that's, a, that's a completely different one that popped up. In the process of researching that anomaly. You can actually find out a little bit more if you want to know what's going on by clicking on the anomaly here. You can see that a glint of metal has activated our sensors. They indicate the presence of some valuable substances in the planet's crust, which is actually kind of surprising because when we looked at Alpha Centauri, we felt that it's not actually that rich in minerals. So what is that metal? What is that resource? Why is it there? Should we care about it? Now, before we let that happen, we've got a new pop-up and some of these pop-ups you can't dismiss. You have to make a decision right now that it's gonna change the course of your empire for, for, for good, honestly. And this one is the Habitable World Survey. This is, we know that we can live in planets out there in space, but should we pursue that? Feels answer feels pretty obvious to me. I think that'd be really cool. But maybe you don't quite care about finding new planets and about finding new places to live. Maybe you're actually doing a challenge run in Solaris where you want to live on one planet and one planet only. You can do that if you'd like to. The Habitable World Survey is going to give us some kind of benefit for finding out about worlds that we could potentially live on. Or if that's not very important for us right now and we really need the unity, maybe we need this 223 unity, which is kind of the, the reward if you don't do this, we could just take the unity and move on. That's a possibility, but I'm kind of interested in finding out about planets out there in the world. So I'm going to start the Habitable Worlds survey event chain. Now, this is going to start a quest and quests are tracked in your situation log under the situation log tab. There are a variety of situations that you're going to be dealing with as you expand out into space. Makes sense, right? There's going to be different research to keep track of. There are going to be different events that might be happening to your empire. If you gain more DLC and purchase DLC for Solaris, there's even more stuff to do. And the situation log gets bogged down with tons and tons and tons of things to explore. I'm talking about you know, archeological dig sites. You're going to have um, the uh, extra dimensional beings asking things of you, all sorts of things. I don't want to spoil too much for those of you that are new to the game, but there's a lot, there's a lot to experience. And 
you're going to find it here in the situation log. We can take a look and see what are the requirements of the habitable world survey. And it shows us that we need to have surveyed eight habitable worlds. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't count the world that we just surveyed, but we've got one more planet that's nearby that we're going to survey in a little bit, and we are going to get one of eight, right? We've got to find seven more, and they are out there, out in the galaxy. We just have to explore them to find out where they are. So that's the situation log, just something that worth noting. Our science vessel is sitting here, just finishing up their research on the strange anomaly that was happening on Alpha Centauri, right? We got a detailed report of its geological riches. And apparently the planet's unique tectonic history has served to concentrate many minerals of interest near the surface. You see a change? Alpha Centauri used to have only three available mining districts, but now it has nine. These anomalies will add new resources to planets. They'll add new resources to astral bodies around a star, and you'll be able to exploit those in the future. It's really important eventually that you research all the anomalies around your space. Right now we're skipping them because we want to learn more about the stars and the star systems that are around us and what planets we could potentially live on. But at some point, I'm gonna to wanna to come back here and, and research these anomalies because they unlock stuff like this. You'll notice that we have a new trait on our continental world as well called raw minerals. And this has added the mining districts to this planet. So now we've got a bit of a choice. We could specialize this planet in generation of energy if we'd like to, which was kind of our original plan. Or, you know, it's, it's one less district than generator districts provide, but we could instead make this a mining district and make this a place where, where we have a bunch of mineral generation. The choice of which one to take when colonizing planets and specializing them is really up to you. And it's dependent also on the other planets that you own. You'll notice that we only produce 37 minerals, but we produce 82 energy, right? These resources are not really equivalent to one another. Energy has these big uh, spikes that go up and down as you play the game, and minerals have these sort of slower uh, arc that, that increases as you increase your ability to make consumer goods or to make alloys. So it's up to you to decide, you know, what order you wanna do these things and, and which planets you wanna specialize as which. I still think this would make a great generator district planet. I think that's fantastic. And so we're gonna go our original route and choose to specialize this in generation of energy. I'll show you what that looks like in this tutorial. But first, we have to colonize it. That's the first thing that we have to do. We have to get a colony ship to actually land here with our very first colonists. And so we can click on the colonize icon here. And what this is gonna do, it's gonna build a colony ship from the closest starport that has a shipyard on it, which is up there in Seoul. If you had multiple species, you could choose which of your species you want to use to colonize that planet. And this allows you, if you have multiple species, to colonize planets that otherwise would be inhabitable for humans, but would still, if you colonize them with, let's say an alien species instead, generate resources for your entire empire, right? We only have humans in our empire right now. Maybe in the future we'll have some other aliens. So for now, we'll build a colony ship full of humans and we can name the planet if we'd like to. I'm just gonna leave it by default. And now what's gonna happen is in the nearest shipyard, we are going to create a colony ship. It requires alloys, food, and consumer goods to do this. So this is another way that the game limits you taking too many planets too quickly. Uh, you'll notice that we only have 75 consumer goods after that purchase. But in a second, the colony ship is going to be created and without us touching it, it is going to fly from Seoul to Alpha Centauri 3 and it's going to colonize our very first non-Earth planet. Very exciting. Before that happens, a couple of things have popped up here that I've sort of ignored. I may have even ignored them in the last tutorial and so I want to get to them now. The first one we're very familiar with by now, I would hope, is we've got a new tradition available for us. And we can now take one of two choices. We can take the expansion of To Boldly Go, which unlocks a new edict. Remember, the edicts are these temporary uh, empire-wide bonuses that we can toggle on and off if we'd like to. And this will increase the output 
of our research stations. Remember, those are the stations that are hovering over planets or astral bodies that provide research. And this is admittedly a very small bonus, but it's a bonus that adds up as you play. It also increases research from starbase constructions. I don't think we have any of those. That would be special buildings or special modules that produce research. It's not really a very good tradition to take. It's not in the early game. 20% of, you know, five is very, very, very low. You're gonna get one extra research. It's not that strong. The one that I think is stronger is science division. And this has a, a term that we haven't touched on yet, but I'll explain what it is. You'll see actually um, um, pretty immediately if we're lucky with our technology, we are. So remember in our technology tree, when we chose one of these three technologies, we picked one and we had three options to choose from, right? These are your three alternatives. So our society from researchers is uh, going to be increased by 20% in a couple of months. When we take this, this uh, tradition, rather, we are going to gain access to one more research alternative every single time we choose a new research. And this gives us a lot more flexibility and a lot more options to choose from. And that flexibility is a really big boon for our empire because it means that if we've got three texts that we really don't like, maybe that fourth one is the one that we're gonna wanna choose. I'm gonna take science division. And in fact, for our next tradition picks, we're going to go all the way down this right side because I find the technologies to be stronger. Uh, sorry, the traditions to be stronger. And then we're going to take our last tradition, which is on the left side here, the database uplinks. We'll take that as our last one. So let's unpause uh, right after we take a look at our first contact. Remember how that there was that alien that we found that was aggressive against our science vessel? Well. We just found out that calling it a life form may be incorrect. They seem to be mechanical drones that have been built for some unknown industrial purpose and possibly are just on the fritz, but we're not gonna be able to communicate with them any further. So this first contact communication is going to end and it's not gonna continue any further than this. Just kidding. Yes, it is. I thought that the uh, that the stage was complete and, and that was the end of communication. Actually, it's going on to stage three. So we're gonna find out a little bit more about them in just a second. Shows how much I know about this feature, right? This is, a, this is a relatively new one. In the meantime, we've got our science vessel here that is sleeping. It's, it, do, it doesn't have any work to do. It doesn't know what it should be doing. And so we've got to give it some, some jobs to do. I'm gonna send it out here to survey this choke point that we talked about. That's gonna be a defensive position for our empire. And we've got our science vessel here that had a little bit of a scrap with those alien vessels. I'm going to send it down south to survey this system, this system here, and up to this system. You can have science vessels actually overlap surveying. You can have three science vessels survey the same system. They'll survey it three times as fast, which is pretty sweet. One thing worth noting as you're engaging with these aggressive vessels throughout the galaxy. You'll notice when I scrolled over this exclamation mark now, we see a new piece of information that we didn't see before. That is their fleet power strength. They have a fleet power strength of 777. They should go to Las Vegas and, and gamble their winnings. And that means that if we were to defeat them, we would likely need a fleet power that is stronger than that. Fleet power is a general representation of how strong your fleet is. But Solaris is a game where you don't have to have the biggest fleet in order to win. You just have to have the smartest fleet, okay? We've got a bunch of vessels here that are pretty aggressive with a fleet power of 777. But remember, we've got our, our little fleet of Corvettes, right? They're, they should be up to snuff. They should be good to go. If we take a look in the outliner or if we scroll over them, over Seoul, where they're currently stationed, they only have a fleet power of 111. If we wanted to take out the fleet that's sitting here, if we want to survey this system and take it for our own, if we want to grab this defensive position, and I would highly recommend that you do that because this is a really strong defensive position here, with this choke point, this path into your own space, we have to summon a fleet greater than their fleet power and stronger than their fleet. Now, 
There are some ways to do this in the future where you can learn a little bit about how their ships are built. You can learn about what they're, what they're made out of and what weapons they might have on them. You don't have that technology quite yet. But instead of being smart, we could just do the brute force method and just build a bigger fleet. To do that, we're going to click on Soul Station and we're just gonna spam a bunch of Corvettes. We can only build five right now. And because we only have one shipyard on this Starbase, we are going to build them one at a time. You'll notice that the queue for the colony ship is being completed first and then followed by the queue for the next Corvette and then the next Corvette and the next Corvette. On these systems, on these star bases rather, you can actually build multiple shipyards if you'd like to. But what you build on a star base is determined by what you need that star base to do. What should it fu its function be? Maybe this is a starport that builds a bunch of ships. In that case, we should replace our trade hub with a shipyard. I don't think that's the smartest decision to do in the early game. I'll explain trade and the concept of trade in another tutorial probably because it's a little bit more of a complex subject. But for now, I'm just gonna build up a couple of Corvettes and I want my Corvettes to build a fleet eventually that is larger than 777. So we're getting there, we're building them. It's just gonna take some time. Now we've got a couple of these technologies that just popped. We just finished our engineering and our society research and you'll notice that the effects of our latest tradition have just come into play. Instead of having three options to choose from, I now have a fourth option that I can choose from. And between you and me, these aren't the best options to get in the early game unless you wanna pump up the strength of your vessels, right? We need to be able to beat a fleet of 777. And normally I would be encouraging us to go for something that's a little bit more economic, a little bit more long-term, but we got to get aggressive. We got to get aggressive now. So we want to choose probably one of these bottom three technologies. The first one gains access to tier two armor, which will increase our armor hit points. Uh, every single one of these armors on a ship by 65 or we could gain Corvette hull points, which is going to increase the value of our hulls on all of our Corvettes by 100, which is, you know, it's pretty good. Or we could grab the afterburners and afterburners, if they're put on a ship, are going to increase not only the speed that we move across space, but also it is going to increase our evasion of enemy attacks by 5%. This is a really tough choice to make, actually. This is a really difficult one to choose, but I think Afterburners is a pretty strong tech overall. Almost all of your ships will have Afterburners on them, and they're gonna give you a 10% movement speed, which can give you a nice one up against typically AI enemies in the game, but maybe also that evasion is gonna come into play against our automated mining drones that uh, on Vilmar here. So I'm gonna grab the Afterburners technology and for our society research, we have something that's a little bit special here. We've unlocked what's called, uh, oh, I actually don't know what the name of it is, but it's almost like a reserved technology that will sit here forever. We will always have it as a fifth option or a sixth option if we have a sixth one or a seventh option if we have a seventh one until we're ready to research it. But we don't have to research it just yet. We can choose to if it makes sense for us, or we could take one of these other options instead. We've got a whole slew of option choices here. We've got the off-world trading company, which gives us that trade value that I was kind of trying to move us away from for now. We'll talk about it in a little bit. We've got a hydroponics bay that allows us to produce more food on our planets, which actually could be kind of useful because we only have a surplus of 25 food per month. Could be something that we could grab. Um, we've got the ground defense planning, which would increase the strength of our defense armies, but we don't see anybody that might come and attack us, or especially not anybody that might land troops on any of our planets. So I'm gonna skip that one. We've got genome mapping, which is I think is a community favorite. It's gonna increase the growth speed of our planets and increase how quickly we gain new population, which is very strong. And then we've got planetary unification, which is one of the technologies we saw in a previous uh, in a previous tutorial, gives us that lump sum of unity, increases our unity gain by 5%, and unlocks a bunch of new edicts that we could use as temporary bonuses. I see these two as pretty strong starting moves. Both are really good. 
If we take a look, and if you're ever deciding between two, you might wanna look and see if there's a path that this is leading you down. The genome mapping path, I'll give you a little bit of a hint, allows you to move down a path where we can biologically engineer and genetically engineer our species to become stronger, faster, more capable at mining or at growing crops or at researching. Maybe all of our species will be smarter. It's a very strong path to go down for sure. The planetary unification path is the administrative path. That's more about gaining unities, uh, gaining unity as a resource, but also about increasing the capabilities of our planets. How capable are they at administrating well-functioning societies? Both of these are really, 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 really good, but I think genome mapping with that pop growth speed almost is always a quick take for me. And also it'd be kind of fun to do some genetic engineering down the, down the line. So I'm gonna grab genome mapping and I promise I'll unpause the game now and let things happen. So we've got our science vessels. They're moving around surveying space. I see a juicy star system there. I don't know if you see what I see but two planets in that system, one of which is a is an ocean world and one of which is an alpine world. That's really nice. But can our population live on an ocean world? Do we have the technology and the capability to thrive on an ocean world, especially if we're putting colonists down on that planet? Are they going to be able to thrive on a world where 90% of the planet is made of ocean? That's, that's tough, we, we don't know yet because we haven't surveyed that planet yet. Similarly, we've got an alpine world, which is a frozen, frigid, barren area. And, you know, relatively small from a planet size perspective. Maybe we can live there, maybe we can't. We're gonna have to give our science vessel a little bit more time to research it. But in the meantime, there should be celebration because we just got our first human colony on Alpha Centauri. On Alpha Centauri now, we can start administrating. Just kidding, it hasn't happened yet. Our colonists have landed, but they're colonizing the planet. And in actually just a couple of years, in what looks like three years, because it's 2206, this is gonna finish in 2209, we are going to be able to finish the colonization of the planet and start administrating it. Now, I'm gonna be honest, if you've been watching Solaris or playing Solaris for a long time, you may have noticed that we have a massive, massive energy credits surplus, a massive mineral surplus, a massive food surplus. I haven't been playing min-maxing the game. I haven't been playing the way the game is meant to be played, but I have been showing you a lot of the concepts. You have noticed perhaps in the outliner that Earth has some icons popping up next to it. And we got some problems. We've got some red numbers and red numbers in Solaris usually means something should be happening and is not happening. This planet has not been administrated very well or at all by me because I've been focused on other concepts. But as you're playing the game, you can keep the game paused as long as you want and you can tackle all of these. We are going to tackle the concept of administration of planets and, uh, and actually administration of your entire empire in our next tutorial. But really quick, I'm gonna finish up a few of these last few decisions. We've got our physics research that is up and we've got four options here. Four pretty good options actually. Uh, improved deflectors is gonna give us shields for our ships and improved shields. The research station output we talked about, right? Uh, not a very good option for us right now, but we'll scale up in the future. We've got one that just gives us a flat out increase to energy credits, but our economy of energy credits is really good. It's really good right now. So I'm not too concerned about grabbing field modulation. Administrative AI though, is going to allow us to research an artificial intelligence that helps all of our scientists with the research speed in every tree across the board. This is a great technology to grab. It's gonna give us even more benefit the sooner we take it. So we're gonna grab that one. We've got a couple of pop-ups that have come up. I'll grab this one in a second, but let's take a look at blimps. Blimps are those deep space mining drones that we were trying to find out more about. Turns out they possess powerful mining lasers, and that's 
no good for us. That's kind of a problem. They might be old, but we should really make sure that we don't get too close to them. I'm gonna say understood. And now, officially, we finished the first contact protocol. We have found out that this is a series of old mining drones. We don't have information about them because we're not in the system where they exist, but we might wanna find out a little bit more before we engage them. Those mining lasers have me thinking there might be something we could do to give us an edge on our robotic enemies and uh, an antagonists in that system there. And lastly, we've got something that's actually very important. And a lot of new players are sort of confused about what this concept is, and it's not really explained very clearly to them, but you should be very aware because it can give you massive, massive, powerful bonuses if you follow this quest. This is an announcement of our precursor. There was some kind of empire that left small traces around the galaxy that they used to exist, this gigantic empire known as the Cybrex. They were machines that had some kind of collective consciousness that connected them and probably lived about 600,000 years ago out there in space. We've only just learned about them, but there seem to be at least a couple of artifacts strewn around that may tell us more about who they were, or maybe where their home system was, where they used to live. This is going to add a situation to the situation log known as the precursors. In Solaris, you will randomly be assigned a precursor from a set list. There's actually a, a lot of them. And you can explore more and find out more about your precursor. If you complete this quest, it will give you gigantic, gigantic bonuses. It is worth doing. Just telling you straight out. Discover more about your precursor. Find out more about them. Find these artifacts, which may be located in some of these anomalies that we found around the galaxy. You may even get some clues to which one of these anomalies may hold artifacts of your precursor. And I would highly recommend you pursue them for sure. All right, that's the end of today's tutorial. Uh, we are going to look at in the next tutorial, how to manage planets. We're going to look a little bit at habitability. You'll notice that here at Asterion, we've got two planets here, but one's green and one's red, which is a little bit strange. That's, that's unlike Alpha Centauri 3 that we're colonizing right now. And in that tutorial, we're gonna take a look all about planets, how to manage them, what things you should keep track of, and hey, if you find the tutorial helpful, don't forget to leave a like. Let me know if there's anything that I haven't explained well enough that you'd like a little bit more explanation of down in the comments below, and I'll respond to your comments as well. And uh, hey, subscribe to the channel if you really enjoy the content as well. We're gonna be looking at a couple different games in addition to Solaris over the next couple of weeks, likely. And uh, if you don't know already, I also stream over on Twitch where I'm making Solaris streams three days a week. So I hope to see you there. Otherwise, have a great, great rest of your day. I'll catch you in the next one.